Welcome to um, graduate student orientation. My name is Angela Barlow and I'm Dean of the Graduate School. Um, and so I have the, this opportunity to chat with you all for just a little bit of time this evening to talk a little bit about really some of the major differences between undergraduate and graduate school and also some of the supports and things that we have in place for you as new graduate students. Um, there will be a, a chance at the end for you to ask questions. We'll use the Q&A feature at the end. And so I'm going to go ahead and advance the slide and get started. So our purpose today, um, as I just said, is really to think about some of the primary policies that are very different from when you move from undergraduate to graduate school. And um, by making you aware of those different policies, our goal is to support you to be a successful graduate student um, because we, our goal is to see you cross the stage and, and be hooded. And so with that in mind, an overview of the topics we're going to go through this evening. Um, first, I'm going to start with some graduate school scenarios. Um, what I've found is that it's way more interesting to think about possible scenarios. We'll do some polls where you can think, put your answer in as to what you think might happen, um, and then think about the policies that are related to those scenarios. And like I said, that's more interesting than if I just put policies up there and read them to you. So we'll do some scenarios. I'll also give a quick overview of Degree Works. Um, some of you may be familiar with that uh, software, but it's a very vital part to our work in the graduate school. So I want to take a moment to look at that. And then the last thing we'll talk about tonight is just some of the different programs and all that we have um, available to support you as a graduate student. So to get started, we're going to jump right in with some scenarios. And this first scenario is titled, Will She Graduate? So let me um, give you the scenario and then I'll, I'll launch a poll so that you can respond. So here's the context. Uh, Maria, who's a graduate student, um, applied to graduate this semester and her degree works audit showed that her cumulative GPA was above a 3.0, so that's good. Um, and then her program GPA, so when you just look at the classes that are needed for the degree, her program GPA was a 2.552. And so the question is, will she graduate? So think about that for a second. And let's see, let me launch the poll. And so if you will take a moment to put your answer up there. Yes, no, or maybe you're unsure. I'll give you all a few seconds. Votes are being cast. We're up to about 70 people. So I'll give you all a few more seconds. Okay, and I'll close the poll in three, two, one. Okay, so let me close the poll and share the results. So I hope that you all can see the results. It looks like um, about 55% of you said no, that she's not going to graduate. Some of you were not sure, and that's fine to not know. And then I have 16% that said yes, she will graduate. So let's see where this takes us. So again, the question is, will she graduate? And actually the answer is no. So let's talk just a minute about the reasons why. And again, that's the part of this that I really want you all to walk away with thinking about. So what's going on here is that in order to graduate with a graduate degree from UCA, you must have a 3.0 GPA, at least a 3.0 overall. So when you look at all of your graduate courses, as well as the major GPA has to be a 3.0. Uh, for most people, if you're taking your first graduate class, uh, first graduate degree, like your overall GPA and your major GPA will match. But sometimes people will take an extra class when they really shouldn't, and that can actually pull their cumulative GPA down and so forth. So that's the policy that's in play here that you have to have that 3.0 in both overall and in the major. So to avoid this scenario, um, my advice to you, and so if you're taking notes, these are the things you wanna jot down, um, is don't take classes that are not on your de degree plan. 
uh, you should work with your advisor. You should look at degree works to make sure everything you're taking is a part of that degree plan. And then also monitor your, your GPA, both your major GPA and your overall GPA. And let's see. And I put some stars around that because that's really important. So we want you to make sure that you're taking classes that are on your degree plan and you're watching your GPA because really, you know, like when you're an undergraduate, if you make an F, you've got like a hundred and something more hours to pull that up. But if you're a master's student in a 30 hour program, an F can be very detrimental. So you want to make sure you're watching your GPA. Okay, so here's our second scenario. Uh, so the question here is, is this a possibility? So let me talk a little bit about the context. So the context here is that Jamie started his master's program in 2008. Uh, he took nine of the 10 classes he needed, and then he left school in 2010. So this is 10 years ago now, and he's decided that he wants to come back to school, and he's thinking that he can take his last class and graduate. So the question is, is this a possibility? So let me find my polling feature. Where'd it go? There it is. And sorry, I'm a little slow on this. I'm going to launch my poll. And again, your choices are yes, no, and maybe you're not sure. Well, the votes are flying in now. We're about halfway through you all. Give you just a few more seconds. Okay, and I will end the poll and share the results. So, so here are our results. So we've got a large majority that are saying no, that this uh, Jamie's not going to be able to just jump right back in and take a class. Um, we've got a few that say yes, and then of course we've got some that are not sure, which is you know why we're here today. So let me stop sharing and go to the next slide. So the answer to this, is it a possibility, is no. Um, that the idea, you know, what's going on here is that there are actually time limits to how long you have to finish your degree. And once that time begins to expire, you start losing classes. And so probably in this scenario, actually these are all real scenarios. And so in this one, um, we looked through the courses and there were a couple of courses that we said, okay, um, probably the content of those courses have not, has not changed, so we'll count those. But basically the student had to start over. Um, so what do we learn from this? Uh, one thing that you have to be mindful of as a graduate student is the time limit associated with your program. Master's students as well as EDS students have six years to complete and doctoral students have 10 years to complete. And although all of that sounds like a very long time, um, it's, a, it's not surprising that we do have a lot of people that start bumping up against those time limits and they start requesting extensions. So again, here I'm gonna show you all my yellow stars because these are important facts to keep in mind is that you want to stay in your program, progress through your program. If things happen, talk to us at the graduate school, but be very mindful that if you walk away, when you come back, you may be looking at completing a completely different program because your courses will be too old, okay? Okay, so now for our third scenario. So here, the question is going to be, is it possible for her to graduate? So here's the scenario. Fran is in a 30 hour master's program. She made B's in all of her classes except for one. And in that class, she had an incomplete or an X grade that after a year turned into an F. And so the question is, is it possible for her to graduate? Um, to help you think about that, like here's a breakdown of her grades. So the degree requires 10 classes and she has B's in all of those, but she's got that one that turned into an F. And so you can see her um, GPA is a 2.7 and she has a total number of quality points is 81. So the question you have to think about is in this case, would the graduate school say, yes, please take another class um, to see if you can get your GPA up back back up to a 3.0. So is it possible for this person to graduate? 
let me get my pole where it go there it is this is pole number three i'm launching the pole so what do y'all think The boats are coming in. And I'm going to close the pole down in about three seconds. Okay, it's slowed. So let me end the poll and share the results. So here we are. Um, we've got about 69% of you all that are saying no. 22% uh, are saying yes. And we've still got that small percent of folks that are not sure. And again, it's okay to not know. That's why we're here tonight is to learn some of these things. So let me stop sharing. And then I'll show y'all how this plays out. Okay, so this is um, best case scenario. So she would be, I think this was a she, I've forgotten. She would be allowed to take six additional hours to, to try to get her GPA up to the 3.0 that's required. And again, she has the 3.0 in her degree right? If you look at, I'm assuming y'all can see my cursor, um, but if you look at the 10 out courses for her classes, she's got these. But overall, even with taking two more classes and getting A's, look, her GPA is only a 2.91. And so this is a case where she would not be able to graduate. So she put completed course, to course requirements, but doesn't meet the graduation requirement of the GPA. Um, so here's what's happening. First of all, that X grade turns into an F after a year. So that's one of the things that happened in this scenario. The second policy, that's policy that is playing into this is that you have to have a 3.0 to graduate, both in your major as well as overall. And the maximum number of credit hours that you can take to improve your GPA is six hours. And we saw from the uh, calculations that that wasn't enough to pull her F um, I mean, to pull her GPA up after taking the F. So again, you know, here are my stars again. He, these are the things that you want to make note of as a graduate student. Um, first, complete all your work on time. Um, if you have to get an X, complete that work ASAP. You know, the default is for a graduate student that you have a whole nother year to do that work and clear that incomplete, but you want to take care of that immediately. And in some cases, keeping that X is, is not an option. You know, like if you're a graduate assistant, and we talked about that in our graduate assistant orientation, to keep your graduate assistantship, you cannot have an X grade. Um, some of the cohort programs won't let you advance with an X grade. But so in some cases, that's not an option. You'd have to work uh, to get your X cleared. But for those of you where the faculty is able to say you have a whole year, don't take a whole year work on it while it's fresh, you'll make the grade and then everything will be good. Um, and then the third point, and so this is a new piece I haven't said yet tonight, is withdraw rather than receive a bad grade. Like I said a few minutes ago, you know, when you make an F in a 30 hour program, that's detrimental. It's not like an undergrad where you've got tons of other classes to pull that up. So it's very smart to stay on top of things, talk with your faculty member and withdraw if you have to rather than receive that bad grade. Of course, there's always implications for withdrawing that are related to maybe scholarships and financial aid. So have those conversations, but keep that in mind. Okay, so Fran, we're still talking about Fran. So this scenario is now continued. So Fran wrote a letter to the graduate dean. So that would be me um, explaining that she had retaken the class that she had got, received the F and she requested that the grade forgiveness policy be applied so that she could graduate. So the question is, should or does the grade forgiveness policy apply? So by grade forgiveness, the idea is that that F would be like forgiven and it wouldn't be a part of her GPA anymore. We would forgive it because she retook the class and made a B. So let's launch another poll and see where we are thinking. Oh, that's the wrong one. See what we're thinking about in terms of grade forgiveness. See, I'll take a second to vote. Oh, 
Ah, this one's a little bit more interesting. Give you all a couple more seconds. And I'll end the poll and I'll share the results. And if you look at that, wow, we are pretty evenly split. We've got about a third of us saying yes, that great forgiveness will kick in. We've got about a third of us saying no, it won't. And we have a third of us that are saying maybe or that they're not sure. So let me stop sharing the poll. Close the poll. And here we go. So does the great forgiveness policy apply? And the answer to that is no. We don't have great forgiveness at the graduate level. So there's no policy for that. And, and we, can't, we can't apply a policy that we don't have. So in terms of things to note, right, uh, to avoid this situation, uh, one, be aware that we don't have great forgiveness. And so that's not something that you can count on. And then we have all the same stuff, right? Complete the work on time. If you get an X, finish it up as soon as you can and withdraw rather than receive a bad grade. Okay, so, you know, Fran came to me and said, you know, can we apply the grade forgiveness policy? And we don't have that. So now gra Fran is appealing to the graduate school um, to have her F changed to a W. So she's thinking, okay, I probably should have withdrawn way back when. I didn't hear my circumstances. Will you go back in time? and change the F to a W. So this actually goes before a subcommittee of the Graduate Council, so they review the appeal. And so then the question is, do you think that the subcommittee will approve the appeal? Oops, let me go back. Let me see if I can get my poll going. And we're on this one. Yes. Okay, so now y'all can vote. Do you think that that subcommittee who's going to review her case is going to approve her appeal? Just a few more seconds. And I promise I've only got like two more polls for y'all tonight. Okay, let's close the poll and I'll share the results. And so this time we're not as split, like a large majority of us are saying, no, they're not going to, to approve that. Some of y'all think that the Graduate Council's subcommittee is soft-hearted and they're going to approve the appeal, and some of you are not sure. So let's find out what happens to Fran. And the question, did the subcommittee approve her appeal? No, they didn't. So what's going on here? The idea of a W, a W, a withdrawal W has to be assigned during the semester in which the course is taken. And so when we get past that time frame, we're not supposed to change grades. And so the subcommittee looked at that and said, I'm sorry, there's really nothing we can do for you to support your appeal. And so, you know, how do you avoid this scenario? Well, the stuff that I've been saying all along, uh, but I'll reiterate it, complete the work. If you get an X, clear it up pretty quickly, and then always consider the option of withdrawing rather than taking a bad grade. Um, even if you think, I'm leaving this program and I'm never coming back, withdraw. Because I have people who show up and they're like, I decided to come back, and now that F is, is hurting them, it's haunting them. Okay, so here we are. I think this is the last question in relation to Fran. So Fran realized that there was no way that she could actually finish her degree. And so she decided to switch programs and pursue a different graduate degree. So the question now is, can Fran actually switch programs? So here's our poll. I'll take a minute to vote. Do you think she can switch programs? Give y'all a few more seconds. Okay. So I'll end the poll. 
and I'll share the results. And about, well, 48% of us think that she'll be able to switch programs. And then we've got some that say no, and then some that are unsure. So let's see how we did on this one. So can Fran switch programs? The answer is no. So what's going on here? Well, the thing is that unlike undergraduates where you can just change your major, um, at the graduate school, you don't get to just switch programs. So if you're thinking about another program, you actually have to go through the application process and apply to that program. And the thing is that now those same GPA issues that are preventing Fran from graduating, right? She doesn't have that 3.0. That's the same problem that's gonna keep her from being admitted to a new program because to start a new program, she needs a 3.0, okay? So again, what do we learn from Fran's story, this tragic story, is complete all your work. If you get an X, get it cleared as soon as you can and withdraw rather than receive a bad grade. So these are very important ideas and they seem kind of common sense, um, but they're worth reiterating, which is what I've chosen to do tonight. Okay, so the last um, scenario that I have is actually a set of scenarios, and I don't believe there's a poll associated with these. Um, but here's the different scenarios. Marsha thought she graduated, but she was one class short. Like she thought it was on her transcript and she came back a few years later to find out only she had not graduated. Um, Jared took the same class twice. Made good grades both times, but took the same class twice. Why would you do that, right? There's no grade forgiveness, so why would you do that? Jamal dropped a class only to learn later that he needed it. And so the question is, how can a student avoid these things? And the answer to that question is to check degree works. And so in just a minute, I'm going to show you all a little bit about how to use degree works so that you don't find yourself in those situations. But before I do that, let me just, oh, there's my stars. I forgot I had those. Um, so before I do that, let me just summarize these scenarios. Uh, first of all, you should not be taking classes that are not a part of your degree plan. That can, um, first of all, you're paying money that you shouldn't have to pay. And second, it can mess up your uh, GPA. And then also monitor your major GPA as well as your overall GPA. Second, be aware of the time limits. Um, like I said, six years and 10 years seems like a very long time, but it'll fly by and we, you'd be surprised at how many of us start bumping against, up against time limits and that can cause problems. Third, and good grief, I've said this like 15 times already, complete all of your work on time, get your grades in. Um, if you have an X, don't take a full year to finish the work. Complete it as soon as you can and withdraw rather than receive a bad grade. And then my fourth piece on this is use degree works to monitor your progress. I think one of the interesting things about graduate school is that most of your faculty advisors, they'll help you in any way they can, but they don't necessarily monitor and track everything. So you have to check and you have to advocate for yourself and that's where degree works comes in. So, let me give you now a brief, oh, before I go to degree works. Those are some sad scenarios I've shared, but we have people graduate every semester. So I don't want to scare you all. That's not the intent. The intent is to just bring to your attention that things aren't the same. There's some differences and it's important for you to recognize those differences. But as you can see, people graduate, they get hooded and, and they go out and they do wonderful things. And you will too. And that's why we're here tonight to make sure that that happens. Okay, so now let me talk about degree works for just a minute. Um, how do you get to degree works? Well, you start by going to my UCA, and once you get there, you see all the different choices, and you select degree works for students, and you log in, and then you'll look at your audit. And so this is an actual student's audit from a year or so ago. And I want to take just a minute to point out some things on this audit, okay? But 
This one is for a student that's in the MFA program in creative writing. Yours will be specific to you and your program based on your bulletin year, and it will list all the requirements that you have for graduating. So the first thing I want to point out are the GPAs that are noted on here. So I've circled them both in red. The one in the top left up here, that is the overall graduate GPA that you have. So if you have some classes from a previous graduate degree, or if you take an extra class along the way for some reason, I like all that graduate work gets factored in there. And then this one that's on the right um, down here across from where it says major, that is your GPA in the degree plan. So that one looks at only the classes that are needed for you to graduate with that degree. Um, this is a student who happens to have made A's and everything, and so those match. They don't always match, but you have to be watching both degrees, okay? The second thing that I want you to take a look at is there's two places to see kind of how you're doing in terms of coursework. One is this progress bar up here. It's at 83%. For this particular student and then the other is down here where I have it circled and you can see this is a 60 credit hour program that that student was in and so far they've completed 54 of those credits okay and I will tell y'all that at the graduate level all of our degree audits are accurate and so if you pull up something and you think something's wrong you need to come and talk to us it's not a case of well maybe they didn't do it right and it'll just fix itself these uh, degree audits are developed and they match the bulletin and they match all the requirements. So if something's not jiving, you need to come and talk to us, okay? Um, next thing I'll show you, this particular section shows you that in terms of elective coursework, oh, and now my cat's gonna come in here. Um, in terms of elective coursework, they're making progress, but they haven't finished. So you can see that of those classes, this one right here that says IP, that one's in progress, or it was at the time I took this screen, this shot, uh, screenshot. Um, and then the others of this particular section, the student has already completed. So that's why it shows up in blue, as opposed to this um, one right here, because it's got this thesis project down here and they haven't um, started, they haven't completed any classes in that section. Um, and then this section, you'll notice where it says not used in degree audits. So this is a class for this student that either the student took the class and it's not going to apply to the degree and therefore it's dropped down here into this section or the student thinks it's going to apply to the degree but we haven't received the paperwork for that. So it's always important to look to see if classes are showing up as not used. And if you think they're supposed to be used, you should go and talk to your advisor because it means that some paperwork needs to be submitted. And so that is degree works. The last topic that we have for this evening, and I'll go through this pretty quickly and then we'll um, have some time for question and answers, is just graduate student support. And there's three pieces to this that I want to highlight quickly. The first is student research funds. So you all may or may not be aware that the university does have a pot of money that's set aside to support student research. And that money sits with me in the graduate school. And so if you're doing research um, or if you're traveling related to research, although not, we're not traveling as much this year, obviously, um, but if there's some way that we might can support your work, then check out the student research funds. If you have questions, you can reach out to me or you can talk to your faculty advisor, but know that that money is there and, um, and that you can apply and receive some of that to support your work. The second support that I wanna talk briefly about is what we call our Bayer Scholar webinars. So we started these last year, although we held most of them face-to-face. -face. This year, we're doing them all in webinar format. And we have one about each month and they are intended to support you as a graduate student in some way uh, professionally. So they're not geared towards undergraduates at all. They're specifically designed for graduate students. Um, this semester's webinar, webinars that we have planned, uh, we have ours in September, which is um, Community of Bears. And so it's really focusing in on diversity, equity, and inclusion um, on our campus. 
And given a lot of the happenings of, um, in our country over the past few months, this is a really important seminar uh, that we're having. And Candace Barnes from the College of Education will be speaking at that one. In October, we will have a 3MT student workshop and you'll just have to look out for more information about what 3MT is. I'm not gonna talk about that tonight, but it's exciting. So be on the lookout and be sure to read it. And then November 2nd, oddly enough, the night before election day, we decided we would have our webinar on handling anxiety and stress. And I believe it's Dr. Rowell from um, the psychology department that's going to lead that particular uh, webinar. So all of these you have to register for. There's information about them on the graduate school website. And of course, we'll be pushing out more information um, via our social media accounts as well as emails. And so then our third um, piece that I want to talk about quickly and, and introduce someone is our graduate student support GA. This is a brand new GA position that we are very, very excited and proud to have. Um, an individual who is dedicated to um, being there to support graduate students as they run into issues or as they struggle with different things. Um, John Scott Kelly is our graduate student in this position. His information is on here. And so John Scott, I'm gonna ask you to unmute and talk a minute. Sure, uh, can everyone hear me? Um, yes. I do have a slide, but this basically covers it. That's my okay. email to get, in, to get in contact with me. Dr. Barlow, feel free to cut in if I leave out anything. But um, the main thing that I've been thinking about with this position, and I'm also really excited about it, is that for one, I have a master's in counseling from the University of Arkansas, so I really understand what it's like to go through grad school, what all the stressors that are involved with that. And another part is that, but at the same time, I'm totally new to UCA. I'm looking to get integrated into campus and figure out what resources are available. And that's what this position is gonna allow me to do. It's gonna take some of the experience that I have, be able to be a resource to people who wanna reach out and talk to me uh, about the stressors that, that are involved with graduate school, but also be someone that can help integrate people in the campus as well. While myself, I'm also being integrated um, I do have virtual office hours that I will, uh, that I have already established and I will be emailing those out. Um, and I'm also going to be really appreciative of any feedback that comes my way as this goes along because this is so new and it's going to be a, a, an evolving process and any kind of input is going to be really helpful. But I really just want to make myself available to anyone who wants to reach out um, and contact me about anything. Excellent. So I was telling John Scott the other day that as a faculty member, I can remember having like a doc student tell me that they spent the evening crying in their bathtub, um, just kind of hiding behind the shower curtain curtain uh, to get away uh, from the people around her at that moment. And so, you know, I recognize that graduate school can be very stressful and there are moments um, like that. But what I don't want you all to think is that you're in it alone that particular graduate student had a cohort of people that she could come together and in many ways commiserate with one another. Um, but not all of us have that cohort of people or sometimes we feel very disconnected. And so that's where John Scott comes in and he is making himself available. Um, you can talk to him, it will be anonymous. He's not gonna like turn your name into the, your program. He's not going to report back to me and say, I talked to this person and here's what they said. It really is just about having someone who can listen and can say, you know, hey, you're worried about paying for your books. Well, maybe you should talk to this person or um, here's some things that you might consider doing to help you to balance the demands that you're facing right now. So John Scott is a resource. And again, we've not had this person before. So this is a step in the right direction. And it's the university's way of saying, you know what, we care about our graduate students and we want them to be successful. So I hope that you'll take advantage of John Scott and what he has going on. Um, as he said, this is a work in progress. So we're going to start with some virtual hours and appointments, but we can um, change that to meet the needs of students in whatever way best works. So we're trying to figure that out. Mm -hmm. So look for more information. John Scott, is there anything else you want to say? Um, just kind of piggybacking off what you said, um, I just want to stress that it's not therapy. It's like, like, it's, mm -hmm. like it is anonymous. It's going to be like um, 
a more of like a consultation, I guess you could say, just really just a talk more than anything. Um, just for me to be someone you can talk to about whatever's going on. Um, and yeah, I wanted, I wanted to stress that I forgot to, that it's not therapy. All of that might be something that's warranted. And I want to destigmatize that since I am a therapist. Um, but talking to me is not in itself therapy. Good. Thank you. All right. So let's see. So that's my last slide. I do want to encourage you if you haven't done it already to follow us either or on all these places, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Uh, we continue to try to build our social media presence and um, we also use that to push out information about different webinars and things. So again, if you haven't followed us already, please do. So now I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And if you have questions, please use the question and answer box to ask some questions so that we can answer those for y'all. Any questions? Oh, okay, here goes one. Um, will, grad, will grad credits transferred show up in DegreeWorks automatically? So if you are transferring in credits from another university, we do have to um, process paperwork related to that. So it will eventually show, like it'll show where the class you took is sitting underneath the class that's required. So it'll show in degree works and it'll show the date it was approved, but it does not happen automatic. There is paperwork that has to be processed and your faculty advisor is the one that has to generate that paperwork. So make sure to talk to them about that, but then you'll know it's been um, processed when you see it show up. Next question says, if you want to take classes in the summer, how soon do you have to inform the grad department? So most graduate students just keep on taking classes through the summer if they're being offered. And so you work with your advisor to identify those classes in the summer and you should be good for that. Okay, let's see. Next question, if we took classes this summer before our official acceptance for the fall semester, will they show up in degree works? So yes, if you took those and they were graduate classes, um, degree works will automatically pull those classes and put them in on that plan like we saw earlier. And if for some reason it doesn't, because there are some times where it'll be a little quirky and it won't pull. If it doesn't, then reach out to us at the graduate school. The person in our office that works with Degree Works is Jennifer Bell. And so you can reach out to her directly. Again, Jennifer, last name Bell, B-E-L-L. -L, and uh, she can fix it so that it'll be there, but it should pull it, okay? But if it doesn't, just reach out to Jennifer. The next question is, at a previous institution for my MA, we were able to purchase personalized business cards with our program, degree candidacy, and university contact info. Is there any way for that to be done here? You know, I've never been asked that question um, in regards to graduate students. So I'm going to ask the person who just asked that to send me an email with that question in it so that I'll follow up and get an answer on that and find out. I'm pretty sure that we could make that happen. I just wanna make sure we I get you the right information on who to contact to, to do that, okay? So if you'll email me, my email is abarlow5, like the number five, at uca.edu. The next question, uh, this is a really good one. How much of the six-year time limit will part-time take versus full-time? So, you know, full-time students, let's say you're in a 30-hour program uh, Full-time means you're taking nine hours a semester. So if you're in a 30-hour program, you finish that program in four semesters or just over a year, right? Part-time students, it just really varies because a part-time student can take one class or two classes. Uh, so there's just a lot of variation in that. And then also some master's programs are 30 hours, some are 36. That MFA program we looked at was 60. And it doesn't matter how long it is, that same six-year time limit is there. 
So it's really important that you keep track of those years and be mindful of that and, and make progress. But do know that at the end of six years, if you say, hey, look, Dr. Barlow, I have been taking classes every semester. I'm making progress. Can I have an extension? I'm going to say yes right? Because there's no reason for you not to have an additional semester if that's what you need. Um, but it is an exception, so you don't want to bank on that. You want to aim to get it done within the time limit. Let's see. We've got a few more questions. If someone fails the program, will you have a chance to reapply in the program? You know, we are actually, um, we've just changed our probation policy and uh, so right now, the way it's written, if you, um, if you end up being suspended from the program, there's no language about having the chance to come back. But the Graduate Council will be taking up that issue this year. So while right now, if you fail out of a program, you don't really get the chance to come back in at some point, um, we are taking that up and we'll have some guidelines around that. So that's a question, check with me in, um, probably in the spring semester and I'll have a better answer for that one. Let's see, when should we contact our advisor and register for the spring 2021 courses? I understand they begin January 19th. That's true, they start right after um, Martin Luther King, King Day. I would actually, um, if you, so all of you are new students, many of you are in cohort programs and so your folks are gonna take care of you and get you registered and you're gonna be fine. If you're not in a cohort program, I recommend that you make an appointment with your with, mm, you make an appointment with your advisor in the next few weeks and ask for a plan for the whole degree. Like, don't ask what am I taking next semester. Ask what is my plan? How do I lay these courses out so that I can take them in the next couple of years and finish? So that that question of what I'm taking next semester is is now answered from now on. Of course, things may change at different points, but at least you've got a plan. Um, and so then once you have that, you'll be ready to start registering as soon as it opens. I'm not sure when registration opens, but it's usually around late October, early November. So you've got a little bit of time, but yeah, I'd work with a, an advisor to get a semester by semester plan, and that'll make registration go a lot smoother. Let's see, if you need to change your primary advisor because of program change, is that handled within graduate studies or the college? So that is something that the program coordinator would then communicate back to the graduate school. So talk to your faculty member, your program coordinator, they'll communicate back to us who the new um, advisor is so that we can get that changed and it'll show in degree works who your advisor is. Let's see. For, for clarity, will the GPA from a master's degree 10 years ago be calculated into our overall GPA for our post-master's specialist degree? If you took that at UCA, yes, it's going, it's going to be sitting there. So your overall graduate GPA includes all of the graduate courses that you've taken at UCA, no matter how young or old those classes are. So yes, they would be included in your overall graduate GPA. What do you do if you find that a course is, that's needed to graduate isn't available? Oh, that is a wonderful question. Um, I would talk, have you talk with your faculty advisor um, because a lot of times we can do course substitutions, we can do independent studies, we have you know, quite a bit of flexibility when it gets down to, I've got one class left and it's not offered that next semester. Um, having a plan that's planned out for the whole program helps to offset that. Um, so if you have that, then you should be definitely, you know, in a better position to finish without running into that problem. But also having that plan helps you because when you get to the end, you can say, look, we did the plan, you gave it to me. And so they, there's a little bit more of an obligation for us to like say, well, let's figure something out as opposed to you just made bad choices and now you have to wait a year until that class is offered again. We don't normally say that, but we, you know, what I'm saying. So definitely we have some flexibility and we can, we can work some things out for you. Let's see. <clears throat> 
One last question here in the Q&A. It says, if we are currently admitted to one track of an MS program, so some of our master's programs have different tracks, <clears throat> and you would like to switch to another, what is the process? So I would say talk to your advisor and then have the advisor contact Jennifer Bell at the graduate school. And she'll make that change both in banner, so in the computer system, the university system, as well as in degree works. And so it will be reflected so that when you open degree works, you're looking at the right um, set of courses. Okay. Those are all really wonderful questions. I do want to look at the chat box to see if there's anything in here. Um, This one says, in my degree works, my graduate application status says, step one application fall 2020. Is there something I'm missing to do? I'm not sure what that um, would be in relation to. I know at the undergraduate level, they do like the first step of applying to graduate, like a year before you think you're gonna graduate and all. We don't do that at the graduate level when you're ready to graduate and receive your degree, you file um, the paperwork that semester. So if you think you're going to complete your degree requirements in spring of 2022, that's the semester that you file your paperwork. So I'm not sure what that message means, but you could email Jennifer Bell in the graduate school. Um, she, like I said, she's our degree works person and she could um, attempt to get you an answer on that and help you figure that out, okay? Well, we've spent almost like 50 minutes together this evening and y'all have been a wonderful audience. Um, from what I can see, you've been very attentive. You've asked some really great, great questions and you participated in my polls and I appreciate that. Please know that um, I'm a nice person. I'll ask, answer your questions. You can email me. You can come by the graduate school and visit us. Um, we have phones, you can call us, although we don't tend to answer them right now, except between 1.30 and 3. So, but if you call during that time, you'll definitely get someone. Um, my office staff is, they are phenomenal. They're all friendly people and we all have the same goal. And that is to see you finish your degree successfully. So I wish you the best. And as more questions come up, please know that your faculty advisor is here to help you. Please know that your instructors care. If you run into issues, go talk to them. Um, don't panic and, and do crazy things. Go talk to them. They will work with you. And um, the graduate school is here and I'm here. And John Scott is here. Please take advantage of John Scott and his willingness to just have conversations and help you think through some things, okay? So with that, I'll end it. And thank y'all again for coming and y'all have a great evening. I don't know why we wave in Zoom meetings, but we do. Bye-bye.